The focus of today's session is Indigenous issues and we'll be, um, through the speakers, directing our attention to issues relating to what governments ought to be doing to help redress problems of Indigenous disadvantage, the um, seemingly entrenched problems in Indigenous, so many Indigenous communities, where the governments are in fact part of the solution and what part human rights have to play in that whole process. Um, we have two speakers. Firstly, Dr Megan Davis, who is the Director of the Indigenous Law Centre and a Professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of New South Wales. She's also a member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and she'll be speaking to you about recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution and how that process might go forward. Megan Davis will speak to you first and will take questions after that because she needs to leave early. Just quickly before she starts, um, those of you who want to get onto Wi-Fi, the login is a little bit different. Um, the password's written there, it's let me in 01. Um, but I'll pass to you from there, from the, sublime to the, from the ridiculous to the sublime, over to Megan. Thank you. Um. Um, as an uh, Aboriginal woman from South East Queensland, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the traditional owners of this country that we're meeting on. And I'd like to thank um, Sarah for the kind invitation to speak today and also Janice Hugo for being very patient in helping me get here, which I did just. Um, so I'm speaking first and take questions first and, I, and then I have to rush off to a Law Council of Australia um, roundtable on constitutional um, recognition um, of Indigenous Australians in the Constitution, which is what I'm going to speak about uh, today, about the work of the um, expert panel on the recognition of Indigenous Australians in the Constitution. Originally, when I was asked to speak, I was um, always going to talk on constitutional reform and Indigenous peoples. Um, but then in December, I was asked uh, by the federal uh, government to be on uh, this expert panel, which has been constituted to gauge uh, the community support uh, for a referendum on recognition. Uh, and so um, given the relative low level of knowledge uh, about the work of the expert panel to date, I thought I would speak about that process today, uh, but also explore some of the reasons why constitutional reform is so important to Indigenous legal and political aspirations in Australia. Um, I find particularly in academia that many are confused by the preference for a constitutional approach rather than a statutory approach, which is perhaps more simpatico with uh, the conservativeness of the Australian polity on rights. Um, so I'm going to address uh, the following issues. Uh, the history of Indigenous uh, or Aboriginal advocacy for constitutional reform, the current process led by the expert panel, uh, um, the key options for alteration of the constitution and then finally my own thoughts so far, um, not the thoughts of the expert panel but my own thoughts um, as we do these consultations around um, Australia. Uh, also just to, to, to say from the outset that in this talk, um, and, and, and uh, I will use the words Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, people and Indigenous peoples interchangeably, um, so while the contemporary preference is for the use of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, the use of Indigenous, uh, I think, is unavoidable when we're talking about Indigenous rights uh, because the international normative framework speaks to Indigenous people's rights. Um, oh, I'm going to end up falling over. Um, when one thinks about the history of Aboriginal advocacy for constitutional reform in Australia, the starting point is uh, often the 1967 referendum. So 67 is uh, regarded or celebrated as uh, one of the most successful referendums in Australian constitutional history and we know that it was uh, over 90% of the Australian population who voted uh, in favour of deleting section 127 and amending section 5126, popularly known as the race power. It's also celebrated as having a very lengthy lead-in time of about 10 years in which Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians work together to, to achieve a successful outcome. Uh, but 1967 did not resolve the issue of recognition um, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, and since that time advocacy for constitutional recognition has continued in the interest of addressing what is often referred to as uh, unfinished business. <coughs> 
Indeed, one of the common criticisms of the current process that's going on is that the lead-in time is too short um, and does not match the 10-year lead-in time of the 1967 referendum. Uh, and I'll refer to that. I'll, I'll go back to that in a moment. Um, but for many people in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, uh, there is a belief, a strong belief, that there actually has been a lengthy lead-in time for further constitutional alteration, uh, in addition to a number of uh, Constitutional Commission reports and Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee reports suggesting constitutional recognition as, as being um, a way forward um, in terms of the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the state. So turning to this lead-in time, which a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people feel um, um, has occurred, uh, during and since the self-determination era, the campaign to address unfinished business has dominated the Aboriginal political domain or the Aboriginal rights movement, which is a loose, informal alliance that argues for recognition of sovereignty, uh, self-determination and recognition of distinct Indigenous rights based on culture, um, such as land and language. A number of significant political statements and reports uh, reflect this. The Social Justice Package reports, uh, which were released in 1995 by the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, Commission, ATSIC, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, prioritised constitutional recognition. The Social Justice Package was a part of the negotiated settlement of the Mabo decision. And in fact, only recently, Paul Keating, um, here in Melbourne, I believe, at the opening of the Lowitcher Institute, um, Paul Keating lamented that the social just justice package has become a forgotten uh, aspect to the Mabo uh, settlement. Um, it was not just about uh, the Native Title Act. So these reports from the social justice package uh, also uh, stress the importance of consultation with communities um, about why constitutional change is important and what possible alteration may look like. Aside from the social justice package, we had the report of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation in uh, 2000, um, which advocated for constitutional recognition. Um, and subsequent, subsequent chapters of the social justice report um, of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. Here I'd also add uh, John Howard's 2007 pre-election proposal to amend the preamble to the Australian Constitution to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, this was the first time, um, or John Howard's decision or announcement um, uh, led to the first time that we had bipartisan support on recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the, in the preamble. Um, and we know that uh, Noel Pearson had worked um, with Howard on this. Also, Kevin Rudd's commitment to consulting on uh, uh, recognition in the Constitution was prompted by all new elders who presented him with a petition um, at the Federal Government's Community Cabinet meeting in Yurikala um, in the Northern Territory uh, in uh, 2008. Also, participants in the Indigenous stream and the governance stream, might I add, at the Federal Government's 2020 summit um, in Canberra also suggested recognition as being significant or important, an important way forward for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the state. So what's the driving force behind this uh, movement? Why is it that constitutional um, um, reform is suggested as being uh, one way of, uh, or, or the most primary way of dealing with or addressing unfinished business? Although it's po politically unpopular to speak about, uh, the driving force behind constitutional aspirations is the lack of recognised status of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the state and a lack of treaty. Australia is, after all, the only common law nation not to sign a treaty agreement with its Indigenous peoples. So it's not surprising, then, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people look to their brothers and sisters in common law countries, such as New Zealand and Canada, and become frustrated at the disadvantaged position a lack of treaty at colonisation slash invasion has left them. Despite the High Court decision in Mabo and the subsequent development of jurisprudence around the common law concept of native title, the issue of sovereignty has not, in the eyes of Aboriginal people anyway, been settled. Also, from my reading of the literature, the, the movement also advocates for the securing of citizenship rights, which are those fundamental civil and political and economic social rights secured to all Australians, yet uh, are not adequately provided to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, particularly in regional and remote areas. Consequently, constitutional rights and citizenship rights are the main thrust 
of contemporary Aboriginal political discourse. So the advocacy broadly is for substantive legal reform that can be small c constitutional change and constitutional alteration proper. This includes but is not limited to constitutional entrenchment of a treaty or agreement power, agreement making power, a Canadian like Indigenous specific right in the constitution and or in a charter of rights that may recognise Aboriginal land rights or native title or indeed promotes and protects Aboriginal cultural heritage including language. It may also include designated Indigenous uh, seats in Parliament um, and also, as I've already discussed, recognition of uh, First Peoples in the preamble to the Constitution. Constitutional reform in whatever form is viewed as vital in order to uh, have sustained attention on the chronic disadvantage that is suffered in Aboriginal communities across Australia and that includes urban and remote and regional communities. The firm belief is that Aboriginal rights need to be taken out of the political arena. As we all know, the principle of parliamentary sovereignty means that the legislative agenda of one political party can be easily amended or abolished by the next. And with three-year political terms in Australia, Aboriginal rights are insecure and uncertain. For this reason, Aboriginal leaders have seen the constitution as being the preferred place for the protection of Indigenous rights, where contestation takes place through judicial review rather than in the realm of politics. However, despite Aboriginal people's preference for constitutional reform, the current temperature in Australia in terms of human rights protection is for statutory recognition. The preference for statutory recognition over constitutional recognition of re rights reflects a number of characteristics of the Australian polity. Um, first, it is a conservative polity demonstrated by the few times in Australian history when con the constitution has successfully been amended. Um, uh, and you'll hear to death over the next two to three years the the oft-quoted statistic that eight out of 44 referendums have succeeded since 1901. Uh, and the successful uh, amendment uh, proposals were those that attracted support from both uh, major political parties. Therefore, it is, it is accepted political wisdom that in order to change the constitution, amendments require bipartisan support. Thus, the preference for a statutory model reflects the resignation of many that um, constitutional uh, reform is virtually impossible to achieve. Secondly, uh, it reflects the dominance of uh, Westminster parliamentary sovereignty um, and the prevailing sentiment in Australian parliaments that their power should not be impinged upon by constraints like a Charter of Rights. Indeed, many Aboriginal leaders were bewildered by the tenor of the Charter of Rights movement in recent years who insisted that having a Charter will have very little impact upon Parliament's capacity to make laws. In many Aboriginal eyes, this meant that, for example, parliaments would still be empowered to pass discriminatory legislation uh, against Aboriginal people as long as they do so politely by issuing a public statement explaining. Of course, Charter of Rights will always change the culture of the way parliaments do business, but that is little consolation for Indigenous interests because the end game is feared. Um, it is feared that the end game will always be the same. Thus, the reasoning behind Aboriginal advocacy for constitutional recognition is partly uh, informed by the insecurity of statutory rights and the brutality of the political arena in Australia when it comes to Aboriginal issues, um, as well as the importance of uh, our First Peoples uh, having a presence in Australia's found foundational documents. So that's some sense of the history and also the motivating force behind Indigenous um, advocacy for constitutional reform um, the other one that I haven't spoken about and which I think a lot of lawyers struggle with and certainly on the expert panel have struggled with and that is the, the, the narrative, what is the narrative behind um, uh, why constitutional recognition is important, um, not necessarily just how that will look, what will that look like. So what is the importance of being recognised um, and the impact that that will have upon a people's, our first people's sense of place and, and identity and I think in um, moving towards um, a potentially a referendum, it will be that narrative um, uh, uh, that will sell the referendum. So in terms of the current process, I just wanted to say a few words um, because as we travel around the nation, there's next to no recognition of the work of the expert panel or its existence. Um, in December 2010, the Prime Minister announced the membership of an expert panel on constitutional recognition for Indigenous Australians. Um, and so that was announced as a consequence of the agreement between the Australian Greens and the ALP, 
uh, which was signed on the 1st of September 2010. Um, and that provided that in the context of recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the government would hold referenda during the 43rd Parliament or at the next election on Indigenous constitutional recognition um, and recognition of local government in the constitution. Um, and also in her letter to um, the Honourable Rob Oakeshott, uh, Julia Gillard confirmed that the new government would pursue a referendum during the 43rd Parliament or at the next election. It's also important to point out that in the lead up to the 2010 election, both the ALP and the coalition supported constitutional recognition. Uh, the coalition's um, 2010 election policy uh, plan for real action for Indigenous Australians stated support for recognition in the preamble and also the ALP's election policy closing the gap um, under the heading of Indigenous constitutional recognition um, supported uh, recognition and also that they would establish an expert panel um, to seek uh, um, the views of the Australian community about recognition um, and what options uh, sh should be put forward on the amendment. So um, in December, uh, uh, the Prime Minister announced the expert panel, um, literally two days before Christmas, I think, um, and the terms of the reference of the expert panel are to lead a broad national consultation and community engagement program so as to seek the views of the whole community, uh, um, including those who live in rural and regional er areas. Uh, the panel is to work closely with organisations such as the Human Rights, Australian Human Rights Commission, the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples um, and Reconciliation Australia, who have ex existing expertise and engagement in relation to the issue, and finally, to raise awareness about the importance of Indigenous constitutional recognition, including by identifying and supporting ambassadors who will generate broad public awareness and discussion. The expert panel itself has adopted uh, a number of principles um, to, that is meant to guide the work that we do, um, and two of those include that the change must benefit all Australians, so it can't be a change that only benefits Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people alone, um, and that the um, amendments or, or amendment um, or suggestions for amendment are legally, technically sound. So there must be no unforeseen consequences. And I'll discuss a little bit more about that in a moment. But presently there is multi-party support for the process and for recognition in, in the preamble. The expert panel has not limited options for reform to just the preamble um, and that's recognising that, that this is a source of tension in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. Um, many who feel that um, recognition in the preamble alone isn't enough. Um, it's also important to note that the coalition has indicated that it is open to more substantive acknowledgement than just preambular recognition. Um, despite the lack of clarity over what recognition actually means, there is universal support for the removal of Section 25 in the Constitution. And I'll explain what that is in a moment for those who don't know. And finally, currently the news poll um, uh, that the expert panel has um, on this question is running at 75% of Australians in favour of some form of recognition. Um, obviously, we know that will fall away once a que questions firm up um, and we'll soon begin testing different options, um, different questions and polling. So what are the key options? The expert panel has released its discussion paper to the public a few months ago and are, and are currently ex accepting um, submissions. Um, it's established a website called You Me Unity that I had nothing to do with. Um, <laughs> and it contains, the website contains ex uh, extensive information and uh, education regarding the process and the constitution in general. Um, it also contains the discussion paper um, and also list the forums where people can contribute to discussion and debate on the issue. Um, so, I mean, I'll do it at the end, but I do urge everybody who is interested in this issue um, um, to make submissions. Um, um, I, I do believe it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So the options. The options listed by the expert panel are only examples of the most commonly suggested ideas um, for reform, um, and that are, they are uh, preamble. Um, also the race power, do we amend or delete or um, insert a non-discrimination clause into the constitution. Deletion of section 25 and also agreement making. So I'll just briefly summarise these um, before ending with my thoughts on the consultation process. 
So in terms of the preamble, this option would require inserting um, paragraphs into the Constitution and a new preamble to the Constitution um, that uh, would recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's distinct cultural identities, prior ownership and custodianship of their lands and waters. Um, in the discussion paper, they've also included um, um, a number of options around what a preamble will look like. One of those is a statement of values. Um, this was a compromise option. Um, it would involve inserting a statement of values into the Constitution at the beginning of the Constitution, a statement which would incorporate recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, as well as the Australian people's commitment to our democratic beliefs, the rule of law, gender equality, um, and acknowledgement of the freedoms and the rights and responsibilities that are fundamental to being Australian. Um, I think I've already made the point that the Aboriginal political domain has already um, uh, uh, stated that it would object to just a preamble alone and I think that that has um, 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 uh, support um, in most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, the preamble is um, regarded as um, um, symbolic and, and nothing that would give substantive rights to, to the community. Um, but having said that, I have found, surprisingly, in my, in my in the consultations I've been on, that there's a great deal of pragmatism in the Aboriginal community also. Um, and a, a lot of um, people are also saying if that is all we get, then that alone is worth something. So it's interesting, as you do get around the country, um, to hear um, some of those views. Um, the next... Uh, option, which really is one of the most significant ones, is what to do with Section 5126. Um, and this is an interesting question because a lot of non-Indigenous people ask as we go around the country, why are we looking at the race power? Didn't we deal with this in 1967? Um, and as many of us would know, one of the unforeseen consequences of 1967 um, and the amendment to Section 5126 is that it created an ambiguity uh, in the race power. Um, so the race power permitted the Commonwealth Parliament to make laws with respect to the people of any race other than the Aboriginal race in any state for whom it is deemed necessary to make special laws. And 67 amended this section so that the words other than the Aboriginal race in any state were deleted. And this meant that the Commonwealth um, was given a new power to make laws for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, and could pass legislation um, with greater scope for protecting Indigenous rights and Indigenous interests. So judicial interpretation is developed in such a way that the race power is now considered to give uh, Parliament power to make laws that are detrimental to and discriminate against uh, Indigenous Australians. Um, the Racial Discrimination Act, which prohibits racial discrimination, does not have the strength of a constitutional amendment as Parliament could repeal it, amend it or override it at any time. So one of the most commonly suggested um, ideas for alteration of the race power is to end it so... Uh, end it? to amend it so that it can be used only for the benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Of course, the question there is that benefit um, is open or subject to interpretation. Um, another option is repeal altogether of the race power. Um, and, and in that case, the Commonwealth would just use other heads of power to deal with Indigenous interests. Um, the third um, option to deal with this that the expert panel has canvassed is inserting a new non-discrimination or racial equality clause in the Constitution. Uh, the question that has emerged here is whether or not a non-discrimination clause could contain Section 5126 if 5126 remains unaltered. Um, and another option which we haven't included in the discussion paper but is coming up um, in consultations, is to insert a new head of power based on cultural heritage, historical disadvantage and or the unique place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the history of Australia rather than one based on race. So that would be like a cultural right. The third option, which I've said, has got total um, multi-party support and that won't waver regardless of what the other options are, is Section 25, which is a provision in the Constitution that contemplates excluding voters in state government elections on the basis of uh, their race. Section 25, um, if a racial group is denied the right to vote in state elections, the people of that race are not counted in determining the number of seats uh, that state is entitled to in the House of Representatives. Uh, so technically the operation of 25 would disadvantage a state that enacted discriminatory voting laws, 
um, by reducing that state's entitlements to seat in, seats in the House of Reps. Um, but many people regard 25 as uh, an outdated um, provision um, and has, it was described in 1988 by the Constitutional Convention as odious and having no place in a modern democracy. So as I said, there's total agreement on um, deletion section 25. The final option I'll just touch upon is agreement making. Agreement making we decided to include in the expert panel's discussion paper. Um, and this is where the constitution is amended to enable the Australian government to enter into agreements with communities which ha would have the force and effect of Commonwealth law. Uh, and this was, this has um, really come about as a result of a 1983 Senate Standing Committee on Constitutional Legal Affairs report which recommended that an agreement um, provision be inserted into the constitution um, which would, as I said, enable the state to enter into agreements with uh, Indigenous uh, communities, groups or bodies. Um, so the idea is that this new provision would be along the lines of section 105A of the constitution that currently provides for um, final financial agreements between the Commonwealth and the states. So they're just some of the, uh, the main key options that um, we've raised in the, uh, in the discussion paper and that are being discussed as we uh, move around uh, the country. As I've said, the surprising issue that has been risen has been this new power um, to recognise uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the basis of their distinct culture um, or cultural heritage um, and not simply on the basis of race. So just to conclude in terms of my own thoughts as a consequence of some of the consultations to date about the expert panel because I think you might find them interesting. First of all, there are very two very different reactions uh, to the idea of constitutional re uh, recognition, of course, um, uh, in terms of both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and non-Indigenous uh, communities. Um, people's reactions, of course, are based on uh, state-based perspectives, so people are very much influenced when you rock up at the time of what's going on currently within their community. So I think, I believe in the Northern Territory, there's a lot of confusion about how this process exists next to the Northern Territory statehood process, as well as questions of the intervention. Um, when we, we did Mount Isa Longreach in Queensland, the live meat export ban was having a massive impact upon employment in Aboriginal communities. So that was really um, some of the key issues that were being raised. Um, but particularly, um, I think with all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities we're visiting, there's a real sense of weariness, a, a fatigue that's palpable, especially among the old people. And we're finding that, for example, in Queensland, a lot of the old people were the kids that were brought up under the permit system. Um, so one of the things I think that we've found is, is a large... Um, is a degree of hurt. The language that's used includes sadness, hurt, exclusion, and a real sense, to quote a number of people, that white Australians hate us. So it's really interesting, the language that's coming across um, in those consultations. The issues being raised by Indigenous people include, as I said before, the impact of the permit system um, upon people's lives and the frustration at that loss of freedom at that time that people felt during the permit era, um, which controlled where people could live, where people could travel to, um, and also controlled Aboriginal wages. Um, the stolen wages issue has been prominent in Queensland and New South Wales. The notion that one worked for a lifetime and has never seen that money and can't pass down an inheritance to, of any kind to their children. There's, very, there's serious resentment about that, the, the, the lack of ordinary Australians' awareness of this period of Australian history, um, let alone the dis dissatisfaction with the stolen wages compensation. On a positive note, the apology has had an, uh, an enormous impact upon the community. I mean, it's featured really large in our consultations. The language we hear from people is that for the first time, Aboriginal people felt Australian and that white people didn't hate them. And that was really, um, came across in all of the consultations. They're not even remotely finished consultations, but the apology is, is featuring really large. Aboriginal people felt very proud of that day and felt really connected to the Australian nation. And I think that that's been really quite an interesting um, outcome and I guess in the context of that and the impact that the apology had on people um, that's why we're hearing that degree of pragmatism around um, 
if it just ends up being a preamble, um, then that's still going to have an enormous impact upon how Aboriginal people and especially our young ones feel about themselves and their place in the state. In terms of the consultations with non-Indigenous Australians, there isn't really any antagonism with the process or the idea. Um, uh, however, in Longreach, we were competing with the Institute of Pub Public Affairs Carbon Tax Seminar, so <laughs> they, they got a lot of people and we didn't get it quite as many. Um, so we packed up early and went and listened to their um, views on the carbon tax. But um, there isn't any real antagonism. That just could be because everybody's potentially angry about a lot of other things. Um, however, the immediate response is, is pretty much the same and that is a perception that all Australians are equal. So you'll rock up to a room and you'll get, we all have the same colour blood, we all have the same shape, hearts, internal organs. Um, um, we're all the same. Um, Australians are equal. There is no inequality in Australia. Why are we just doing this for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Having said that, those same people, um, when we consult with them, respond very well to the alternative perception that in, fact Australians, that in fact Australia and us as Australians have always acknowledged that we are not equal and often have to take measures to address that. Um, um, and whether that includes welfare benefits, universal health care system, ag agricultural subsidies or special entry, not just for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids but for Australian children from low socioeconomic rural areas. So people respond quite well to an alternative perception that in fact we aren't all equal in Australia. Um, in finishing, uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of um, things that I think we need to be cautious about too as um, as a, as a uh, community and that is um, by acknowledging that constitutional reform in whatever form it takes is not the end of the process and it can't be re regarded as the solution. Um, and I think people are painfully aware of this, um, that it's not going to be the final outcome for unfinished business. And as I said earlier, one of the principles of the expert panel is that there will not be any unforeseen consequences. Uh, but given the experience of 67, we have to keep in mind that there will always be unforeseen consequences. Um, and that is because we have to keep in mind the power of parliamentary sovereignty, Parliament's power to make or unmake laws. Um, so a parliamentary sovereignty is constrained by the Constitution but also informs its operation. We know that parliamentary sovereignty has secured statutory rights that have benefited Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, but ancillary to that are Parliament's general powers of statutory amendment and repeal and I think the 1998 amendments to the Native Title Act are an example of that. Our parliamentary sovereignty where weight is given to the intent of Parliament will remain a prominent feature of any revised constitution and that's something that we need to keep in mind and especially when managing the expectations of um, in particular Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Of particular currency is the fact that if you amended the race power to ensure that laws are made only for the benefit, there is still a question of what that word benefit means. Would a High Court defer to the democratically elected Parliament's idea of benefit? There was bipartisan support uh, that the Northern Territory Emergency Response was beneficial. That also raises my final point regarding constitutional interpretation. We know that whether it be uh, an originalist approach or an approach more favourable to international human rights law, um, a constitutional approach means that one can never predict the outcome of how a court will interpret Indigenous recognition, uh, recognition in the future. Uh, as I've said, some are concerned that a non-discrimination clause alone would not be sufficient to contain the intent of the racist power if the racist power is unaltered. Uh, uh. So to finish with, we're in an interesting situation where the federal government has finally moved on its policy of support for recognition, um, although I think helped a lot by the Australian Greens. Um, it is unclear at present what recognition means, um, what form that will take, whether it means only the preamble or whether it will mean more than just um, recognition in the preamble. Constitutional lawyers often speak about the constitutional moment where moons unexpectedly align in a way that there is a constitutional shift which ordinarily could not be achieved. Um, I'm not so certain if, oh, well, I'm not certain if this is one of those moments. I oscillate between pessimism and optimism. There's a lot of focus, I think, in, in the Indigenous community on the negatives. Um, not, a long not a long enough lead-in time, not the right people on the panel. Um, also, a lot of people saying that, do we really want to go ahead with this? Um, others saying we need 90%, otherwise race relations will be doomed. 
I mean, 90% of people voting yes. Um, but I do think it is a one-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Um, and I think I, I was at a workshop recently and was really inspired by Marcia Langston, who gave a really powerful speech, as she often does, um, saying that, you know, that a lot of the leaders who have been advocating for recognition for decades are now dying and are very sick. Um, and they are tired and they think that it is worth pushing ahead with this time. Um, and as many of us know, we have an extremely young community in the Aboriginal community, um, um, close to half are under the age of 30. Um, and we, in our community, speak passionately about the impact of disadvantage and racism upon our young ones. And that's been really palpable in the consultations around the country, the level of herd and dislocation among our young ones. And a lot of the old people who grew up uh, under the mission movement, the permit system, who had their wages uh, stolen, their lands lost, they think it's worth taking the gamble because the effect that recognition will have, even if it is just the preamble, um, will have an enormous uh, impact upon the self-worth and so sense of belonging um, of young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and that's incalculable. It's, it's invaluable. I cannot even begin to tell you the impact um, it's had, and I've seen it on the faces of not our non-Indigenous um, brothers and sisters on the expert panel, to hear so many Indigenous communities and individuals say that they don't feel like they belong in Australia and they don't feel Australian, um, and that the apology was the one day they felt Australian. Um, and then, as one woman said in Manhisa, then the ads came on and it was all over. Um, it's truly heartbreaking. And I think in moving forward with this process, we have to keep in mind also that the narrative of this, the story in terms of how we're going to explain to the nation why this is important, is as equally important as the complex conversations about what form constitutional recognition may take. Um, and in just finishing, I again just urge everybody to make submissions if you are interested in, in, this, um, um, in, in this issue, which I think all Australians should be. Um, as I said, there's that website um, where you can make a submission via the website or a for more formal academic submission, but we're really interested in hearing people's views, particularly around options, but also around why this is important and the why is um, um, equally, if not more, as important. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for a fantastic introduction and a rundown of the various, um, many of the various options available in what really is um, pretty much one of the main games, um, main things that are happening um, in Indigenous affairs at the moment and is extremely important to raise the awareness of these issues. We do have time to take just um, a couple of quick questions. Yes? Um, Brian Keown Cohen from the Melbourne Bar. Uh, Megan, thanks very much for that paper. Can I just uh, make a comment from a barrister's practical point of view? On the one hand, we have the option of substantial amendments. I think of the Canadian Constitution, which runs for pages, very strong constitutional protection for First Nation rights. I think of the South African Constitution after Mandela. You can even look to Brazil. On the other hand, we take the practical view that uh, many referendums will fail if they're more than one line long. That's the nature of the Australian polity, unfortunately supported by the Australian media, media at the moment. Uh, uh, that takes me to uh, two propositions. First, this is not recent history. Dr Nugget Coons, in his Makarata Treaty Committee, was very active raising precisely the same issues in the 1980s. Uh, secondly, your uh, option of the 105A agreement solution uh, c can be considered here. That provision's been there for a long time. It enables the Commonwealth and the states to enter into agreements on financial matters. That could be added to 105 capital B. The Commonwealth and the states may enter into agreements concerning Aboriginal matters or, sorry, Indigenous or Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders matters. That's one line long. The deficiency in that, of course, is, well, fine, but will the Commonwealth and the States do it after a successful referendum? Uh, it, it parks the problem 
down the track for future generations. So your comment on that I'd be interested in. And lastly, you haven't mentioned the terrible problem that the tabloids would have us believe, i.e. you can't have constitutions being interpreted by unelected judges. That's handing the democratic process to those dreadful people called high court judges. Has that been an issue that's, that's bombarded you in your discussions around the country? Um, well, on your last comment, no, um, simply because um, there's quite a low level of literacy around the Constitution and Australia's legal and political system, full stop, and that's coming across very clearly. Um, in fact, most of the consultations on you know, both non-Indigenous and Indigenous communities is the first time they've seen the Constitution. So, um, and we give out the little Constitution. So um, that hasn't come up yet. I mean, I'm sure it will. Um, it's inevitable. I agree on the comment about 105B. Um, will it even be used? That's, yeah, that, that's something that we've, we, we have um, um, considered. Um, and I agree with you that it's not recent history and, um, and I didn't put in the entire um, decades of history of, of that, but I think that's a really strong point that a lot of this work's actually being done. And certainly when we're looking at agreement making, um, you know, there's so much work's been done on that, including the drafting um, of that section. So a lot of that's been... That, that's what's been great about this is that, the, you know, on both the Indigenous and non-Indigenous side, um, especially in terms of... Um, um, the political side, there's been a lot of work that's been done already. Um, it just doesn't have a high level of recognition uh, in, in the community. Um, and we, but we are getting that comment from a lot of people that um, it can't be more than one lo line and that you can only ask one question. And um, Yeah, that's, that's coming up a lot. Do you say to them, well, look at the Canadian uh, Constitution that country hasn't imploded, its economy is running along and society s still talks to each other, mm -hmm. yet there in the Canadian Constitution is a huge list of rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question from uh, about the fifth row in the middle. Yep, Patrick. The, your comment about the... Thanks for a very interesting talk. Your comment about the low level of literacy sounds kind of right, just kind of to intuition and, say, teaching con law students and so on. <laughs> and I sort of say that uh, I mean, Australians on the whole, I think, are sort of quite alienated from their constitution in a way that, say, probably Americans and perhaps Canadians aren't and perhaps South Africans aren't. Um, do you see that that kind of creates a space for opportunity or a problem? In the sense, like, the problem could be because people are alienated, they won't engage with it or change it. The opportunity could be that, in a sense, this is where your unexpected consequences come from. That are sure. kind of what begins the technocratic process with a little bit of goodwill or indifference could actually produce a document that might be able to reduce alienation yeah. downstream. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's. Um, I think that that's. Uh, that's what we. I mean, I think what's coming across. Um, the more consultations you do is that political leadership is so, so important. I really get... I mean, you know, you teach public law and, you, I mean, you really get that notion that, you know, these successful referendums only got up because of bipartisan support and you can really see that, that, um, um, you know, people are quite confused about the legal and political system, the constitution, when, when we go around to these consultations and that um, why people take put a lot of trust in their elected representatives to give them advice on whether this is a good or a bad thing. Um, um, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I think it will help. I'm hoping it will help the lack of literacy, yeah. Got time for just one more question at the very back there. Um, on the right, very quick question. We'll have to finish up. Hi, my name's Shireen. I'm from Cape York Institute. Um, Megan, do you think that a substantive provision in the Constitution recognising and protecting Indigenous languages is something that would be supported by the Australian public at referendum? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, ultimately, we will take our lead from the submissions and what what people are saying and what people want. I mean, I think it's been quite surprising the 
I've found it surprising just the number of um, Indigenous communities who are talking about a cultural heritage, some form of recognition of culture um, and protection of language and um, Aboriginal culture. Um, uh, I guess the issue also will be how you couch that, how would you draft that, what would it look like in terms of it benefiting all Australians. I think um, um, one thing that the panel and I think it comes across in the discussion panel, discussion paper of the panel, is that one of the things that we're focusing on is that Aboriginal culture isn't just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's culture. It's actually the inheritance and culture of all Australians. And it's something all Australians um, 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 should be proud of, um, should learn about, but also should, should, should want to protect. And then there's the other question of whether... If, um, um, whether that kind of protection of languages or other aspects of cultural heritage um, should be a general, more general one um, that in incorporates um, all... I mean, I don't know how that would look, but um, uh, all cultures, not just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But, um, look, I have to say I've been surprised that that's been such a big um, um, focus. But, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know what the Australian community will agree to, but um, certainly that one is one that's fe featuring prominently. Thank you once again, Megan, Thanks. for an important talk. Um, we'll pass you over now to Mr Rex Wild. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.